Red Willow Vineyard sits at the far western end of Washington's Yakima Valley. The drive out Wapata Road takes you through farmland with rolling ridges on either side like giant sleeping lions. Mount Adams looms larger and larger ahead even as it slips behind the ridge line. You come almost to the end of where there is green commercial agriculture, and there you find Red Willow Vineyard. This iconic and historic vineyard is unassuming. We drive in and find Jonathan Sauer there to greet us. He is humble and excited to have us and show us the vineyard. We gather our camera gear, climb onto the ATV, and he drives us up the hill into the vineyard. Yeah. I might just kind of stop at a couple areas. That's fine, yeah. We stop periodically and he shares with us stories of the iconic blocks. And that's something we've really done. Uh, it goes back to David Lake. I don't, do you know? I, I know. I'll, I'll, I'll kind yeah. of tell you as we go. Um, he was a master of wine that we, he made wine for, from Red Willow for over 30 years. And, and so we learned a lot and he'd always, well, let's put this and this. So a lot of the, the wineries we've helped you will do designates. And uh, so we'll, if, you know, we're really honored they do that, and if they're willing to do that, we'll, we'll try to give them the tools they need to maybe elevate that and make it a little better. And say, well, you know, maybe this block will go with this one or, or stuff. We pass rows with tags on the end, labeling the names of the wineries who will make these grapes into wine. Owen Rowe, DeLille, Betts. Tall signs tower above the vines, each with a year and a variety. 91 Sangiovese, 89 Cab Franc. We drive out to the peninsula block with its layers of ancient soils exposed. The top of this block sits above the Missoula floodplains. It was an island in this valley in those ancient times. We're right at the, uh, the shop, would be about 1,100 feet. Okay, wow. And the yeah. very high end, actually would be in our, we call it our Marku block. Okay, the very right. top of that vineyard would be about 1,300 feet. Um, so we're kind of in that range. And, and what's really interesting is, is about a third of the way up the hill, you guys are, I'm sure, heard the story of the Great Lake Missoula yes, floods. Yes, the Missoula and floods. Okay, so, so the floods would have, washed into about a third of the way up that hill. Wow, so, so that's, all sits above floodplain. So wow. yeah, so you so you have all these kind of ancient uplift soils and, and uh, a lot of these predate like cascades and they're, they're like millions of year old yeah. soils. He tells us about the original 73 Cabernet that they only recently had to pull out. It had leaf roll and they couldn't let it spread. There were a lot of sad winemakers that day. There's the 85 Nebbiolo and the 85 Syrah and the Mataro that his father planted after a trip to Europe on low trellises as they do in Spain. It's probably easier to, to make a wine out of, say, you know, say I'm, I'm gonna get stuff from Walluk and Horse Heavens and Walla Walla and you know, all these different components and create a blend, but to do a vineyard designate, you know, it's, it's it can be a little more challenging, but, uh, but yet, when you do it right, it can just be like a magical wine and just that sense of place you get from it and, yeah. and everything is just, there's so much more depth to it. At last, we drive up to the iconic chapel, inspired by the chapel at Hermitage. This small stone chapel has become a symbol of this vineyard, sitting atop its hill of Syrah. Waiting in the shade is Jonathan's father, Mike who started this vineyard, planting test blocks with Dr. Walter Clore and then developing a relationship with David Lake, the longtime winemaker at the Columbia Winery. In the shade of the chapel, he shares with us stories of how this all began. These are the stories of the beginning of modern Washington wine. And uh, he said, well, you, you need to experiment with something of the new kid on the farm. So, oh, very good. so I, I'm not really sure why I, I got into wine grapes, to be honest with you. I had a choice of cherries or apples or, or grapes. And, and at the time, uh, these French sounding wine grapes were just beginning. Things like Pinot Noir and, 
and things like that. We didn't know how to pronounce a, a Pinot or, or a Cabernet Sauvignon. And it, it was just something exciting and exotic to, to think about wine grapes instead of what's typical in this valley of, of Concord grapes for, for Welch's juice, and jam, and jelly. approaching 50 years or I think we're 47 this year so we're, we're still got a lot to learn and, right. and we're just every year trying to get a little better and learn a little bit more. We finished the evening at a picnic table eating fresh rainier cherries, enjoying a glass and watching birds sweep through the sky snatching up bugs as the sun slowly sets over the ridge.